this mode, and this is ChatGPT running on an Android phone. Now it works the same on the iPhone. The only problem is I can't get it to record audio on the phone that I'm currently using. So I'm gonna show you what this sounds like um, if you're just sitting here using this phone. And again, this is just ChatGPT. You have to have the paid version and you have to have the latest version on the phone. And you'll notice these little headphones over here. When you do that, when you click that, it's gonna go into conversation mode. Check this out. Hey, um, tell me about the Chinese government and how it came to power. Sure. Um, the Chinese government as it is known today is primarily led by the Communist Party of China, CPC. The CPC came to power in 1949 after a long period of civil unrest and conflict. So in the early 20th century, China was in a state of turmoil, dealing with the fall of the Qing dynasty, warlord era, and foreign invasions. In 1921, the Communist Party of China was founded. It grew under the leadership of figures like Mao Zedong, especially during the Long March in the 1930s. The key turning point was the Chinese Civil War, which occurred in two main phases. First, wait, from 1927 wait. to 1937. I have grown bored of hearing about China. Tell me about the role of P53 in protein synthesis. Sorry, I'm having issues right now. Okay, let's try I not understand what you said. Tell me about the role of P53 in protein synthesis. P53, often described as a tumor suppressor protein, plays a critical role in regulating the cell cycle and thus functions as a key player in preventing cancer. However, it's not directly involved in protein synthesis. Instead, its influence is more about DNA repair cell cycle regulation and apoptosis, programmed cell death. When DNA damage occurs, P53 is activated. It can then trigger several responses. One, DNA repair. P53 can stimulate the expression of DNA repair proteins if DNA has sustained. Hey, I'm sorry, but um, what I really wanna do is I wanna put on a play where uh, actors in the play are going to represent different proteins and then one actor will be P53. Can you tell me some stuff about how that play should go down? Sorry, I'm having issues right now. <laughs> Let's try that again. Could not understand what you said. Okay, so I, I think I wanna make a play uh, where um, some of the actors are going to play proteins and then one of the actors will play P53. Can you tell me something about how maybe that plot of that play might play out? What a creative idea. Your play could revolve around the concept of a cell where each actor represents a different component or molecule. The character playing P53 could be portrayed as a vigilant guardian or a wise leader within the cell. Here's a rough plot idea, setting. Inside a human cell, portrayed as a busy city or a control center, where various proteins and molecules interact like citizens or workers. Act 1, Peace in the Cell. Introduce the cell, its daily functions and key characters, proteins, DNA, etc. Uh, P53 is introduced as the respected guardian, maintaining order and ensuring everything works smoothly. The cell faces minor threats like DNA damage, which P53 efficiently manages, showcasing its role in repair and monitoring. Act two, the crisis, a significant threat like severe DNA damage or cancerous signals is introduced. Tension as the cell's harmony is disrupted. P53 leaps into action, trying to address the problem. It orders repair proteins to fix the damage and commands the cell cycle to halt. Act three, the decision, the climax where P53 must decide the fate of the cell. If the damage is repairable, P53 successfully orchestrates the repair and the cell returns to normal. If the damage is too severe, P53 makes the hard decision to initiate apoptosis, sacrificing the cell for the greater good of the organism. Act four, the resolution. 
Reflect on the sacrifice and importance of P53 in preserving health. Emphasize the role of P53 as a protector against cancer. End with a message about the wonder of cellular processes and the importance of scientific understanding. You can add dramatic elements like internal conflicts, interactions between different proteins, and the cell's response to external signals. This play would not only be educational, but also a creative portrayal of cellular biology. Would you like more details or suggestions for specific scenes? Nah, I'm kind of bored of this now. I think I want to make a soapbox derby car out of mushrooms, not mushrooms, uh, marshmallows. Can you suggest how I would maybe build something like that? Building a soapbox derby car out of marshmallows is a fun and unique idea. Since marshmallows aren't known for their structural strength, uh, the key here is to use them creatively while ensuring the car is still functional. Here's a basic approach. One, frame. Start with a lightweight frame that can bear the load. This could be made of thin wood or strong cardboard. The frame is essential for holding the marshmallows and other components in place. Two, marshmallow body. Use marshmallows to create the body of the car. You could stick them onto the frame using a non-toxic adhesive. Wait, wait, I, I wanna know how do I make my own marshmallows? Sorry, I'm having issues right now. Okay, so I wanna make my own marshmallows. Do you have any suggestions for how I can do that? Making your own marshmallows is a fun and tasty project. Here's a simple way to do it. Ingredients, sugar, this is the main sweetener. Water for dissolving and cooking the sugar. Gelatin, this helps the marshmallows set and gives them their characteristic texture. Vanilla extract for flavor. You can also experiment with other flavors like almond or mint. Corn syrup. This stabilizes the sugar syrup and gives the marshmallows a smooth texture. Corn starch and powdered sugar for dusting the marshmallows to prevent sticking. Steps 1. Gelatin preparation. Start by sprinkling gelatin over cold water in a bowl. Let it sit to soften. 2. Make the syrup. In a saucepan, combine sugar, corn syrup, and water. Cook this mixture over medium heat until the sugar dissolves, then bring it to a boil. Boil it until it reaches the soft ball stage around 240 degrees Farrah's or 150 degrees Celsius. Three, combine. Pour the hot syrup over the gelatin mixture and stir until the gelatin dissolves. Four, whip it. Using an electric mixer, whip the mixture. It will turn thick and white. Add vanilla towards the end. Five, setting. Pour the whipped mixture into a pan that's been dusted with a mix of cornstarch and powdered sugar. Smooth the top and let it sit uncovered at room temperature for several hours or overnight. 6. Cutting. Once set, turn it out onto a surface dusted with more cornstarch and powdered sugar mix. Cut into squares or desired shapes. 7. Final dusting. Dust all sides of cut marshmallows with the cornstarch and powdered sugar mix to prevent sticking. And there you have it, homemade marshmallows. You can enjoy them as they are or use them in your soapbox derby car project. Do you need tips on storage or other variations to try? No, but you mentioned cornstarch, and I really don't understand what cornstarch is or really how it applies here. Why would I want to use cornstarch to make marshmallows? Cornstarch is a fine white powder made from the starchy part of corn kernels. It's widely used in cooking and baking for several purposes. In the case of marshmallows, cornstarch plays a couple of key roles. One, prevents stickiness. Marshmallows are very sticky when freshly made due to their high sugar content. Dusting them with a mixture of cornstarch and powdered sugar helps to create a non-stick surface, making them easier to handle and cut. Wait, why, um, why does cornstarch make it non-sticky? Sorry, I'm, I'm having issues right now. Okay, why does cornstarch make something non-sticky? Cornstarch makes things non-sticky due to its fine, powdery texture and its ability to absorb moisture. Here's a bit more detail. One, absorbs moisture. Cornstarch is excellent at absorbing and retaining moisture. When applied to a sticky surface, like freshly made marshmallows or dough, it soaks up any surface moisture. This reduces the overall stickiness. Two, 
forms a barrier. When cornstarch coats a sticky substance, it forms a dry, protective layer. This barrier prevents direct contact with the sticky surface, making it easier to handle. I, I, I want to know more about how it is able to, to do that at a chemical level. Can you tell me about that? Certainly. The ability of cornstarch to act as a non-stick agent and moisture absorber is rooted in its chemical structure and properties. One, composition. Cornstarch is primarily composed of long chains of glucose molecules, known as polysaccharides. These polysaccharides are made up of two types of molecules, amylose and amylopectin. Two, amylose. This is a linear polymer of glucose units. Its linear structure allows it to form a rigid, crystalline structure that doesn't bind well with water. This contributes to the drying effect of cornstarch. Three, amylopectin. Wait, are, are there other things? Wait. Uh, let me clarify my earlier point about cornstarch. Cornstarch, okay. composed primarily of amylose and amylopectin, which are types of polysaccharides, has a unique interaction with water. Its ability to make things non-sticky is due to how these molecules behave when they encounter moisture. One, amylose. It forms rigid crystalline structures that don't interact strongly with water, contributing to cornstarch's ability to create a dry, non-sticky surface. Two, amylopectin. With its branch structure, it's effective at trapping water molecules, aiding in the absorption of moisture. When cornstarch is spread over a moist surface... Hold up. That amylose stuff sounds really useful. Is there, are there other things that have amylose like that that would prevent them from getting wet? Yes, amylose is indeed a useful substance due to its properties and it's found in various starches besides cornstarch. Amylose is a component of many plants' natural energy storage system. Its ability to resist absorbing water quickly and forming a gel at lower temperatures makes it interesting in various applications. Here are a few examples. One, rice. Different types of rice have varying amylose content. Long grain rice, like basmati, typically has higher amylose content, which is why it's less sticky and more fluffy when cooked. Two, potatoes. Potato starch also contains amylose, although the amount can vary depending on the type of potato. Potatoes with higher amylose content tend to be less creamy and more firm. Three, wheat. Wheat contains amylose, although its content is generally lower than in... If I coat my body in amylose and then jump in a swimming pool, will I get wet? Coating your body in amylose before jumping into a swimming pool it is an interesting idea, but it wouldn't keep you dry. While amylose does have water-resistant properties due to its structure, it's not waterproof in the way you might be hoping for. Here's why. One, water resistance versus waterproof. Amylose can resist absorbing water to some extent, but it's not completely waterproof. Water molecules would still be able to penetrate the amylose coating and reach your skin. Two, solubility and breakdown. In a swimming pool, especially over time, amylose would gradually begin to break down and dissolve. Warm or hot water would speed up this process. Um, three, coverage and thickness. Creating an even, impermeable layer of amylose all over your body would be quite challenging. Any gaps or thin areas in the coating would allow water to seep through. So while it's a creative thought, in practice, an amylose coating wouldn't be effective at keeping... Okay, but let's assume that I really wanted to coat my body in amylose. Uh, how much amylose do you think I would need, and where could I buy it? If you're determined to experiment with coating your body in amylose, estimating the amount needed would depend on your size and the thickness of the coating you want. Let's make a rough estimate. One, surface area of the human body. The average adult has a body surface area of about 1.7 square meters. Two, thickness of coating. Let's assume you want a thin layer, perhaps 0.5 millimeters thick. Three, volume of amylose needed. Uh, the volume needed would be the product of your body's surface area and the thickness of the coating. Uh, let's calculate that. Text volume equals text surface thickness. Volume equals 1.7 text square times 0 0.0005. Volume equals... 0 0.000085. Now converting cubic meters to liters, one cubic meter equals 1,000 liters. Volume equals 0 
times 1,000 equals 0.85. So you'd need about 0.85 liters of amylose. Considering that amylose is a powder, you'd also need to factor in its density to convert this volume to weight, which varies. Where to buy amylose? Amylose isn't typically sold in its pure form in standard stores. Uh, you might find it from scientific supply companies or specialty suppliers that offer products for laboratory or food industry use. Online marketplaces geared towards scientific or culinary supplies might also have it. Keep in mind that amylose from different sources can have varying properties, so ensure you're getting the right kind for your experiment. Would you like any safety tips or further guidance on this project? Oh, yeah, I need to know what kind of amylose I'm going to need for this. For coating your body as an experiment, you would want to look for a type of amylose that is one food grade. This ensures that the amylose is safe for skin contact. Food grade amylose is used in cooking and food manufacturing, so it's held to standards that make it non-toxic and safe for external use. Two, high purity. Look for amylose with high purity, meaning it's mostly amylose with minimal other components. This helps ensure consistent properties and behavior when you apply it. Three, fine powder. A fine, powdery form of form of amylose will be easier to apply evenly over your skin and will adhere better. Four, high amylose content. Some products may be labeled as high amylose cornstarch. These have a higher proportion of amylose compared to regular cornstarch making them more suitable for an experiment focused on amylose's unique properties. When purchasing, you might find amylose listed as a specialty item in suppliers catering to the food. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, so are you saying that I can't eat a um, marshmallow because it's covered in amylose and then it's not going to get wet when I put it in my mouth? Sorry, I'm having oh, issues right, 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 right now. Right, right. Okay, okay, Could okay. So, so here's the question. Why can I eat a marshmallow? Because it's uh, it's covered in amylose, right? So when I put it in my mouth, uh, how, how is it possible that it get, gets wet and then, it, uh, and then it, it goes down my throat? How does that even work? You're right that marshmallows are often coated in a mixture of cornstarch and powdered sugar which includes amylose from the cornstarch. However, the reason you can still eat them and they get wet in your mouth involves a few factors. One, quantity and coverage. The coating of cornstarch amylose on a marshmallow is very thin and doesn't cover the entire marshmallow. It's enough to reduce stickiness, but not to make the marshmallow waterproof. Two, saliva breakdown. When you put a marshmallow in your mouth, your saliva, which contains enzymes like amylase, starts to break down the starches. Amylase specifically breaks down amylose, turning it into simpler sugars that dissolve easily in water. Three, absorption of moisture. As you chew, the mechanical action and the warmth of your mouth further break down the structure of the marshmallow, allowing it to absorb saliva and become moist. Four, dissolution of sugar. Marshmallows are primarily made of sugar, Thank you for entertaining me tonight with uh, these, these, you know, my, my weird questions. I really appreciate that. Sorry, I'm having issues right now. Could not. Hey, thank you for putting up with my weird questions tonight. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. No question is too weird, and I'm here to help with any curiosity you have. If you ever have more questions, whether they're unique, serious, or just for fun, Feel free to reach out. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Rest well, and I'll be here if you have more questions in the future. Take care. Okay. Now, obviously, that was a bunch of crazy questions. And my point here is, if you think about this, one of the biggest problems with learning is that it's difficult when you're learning something from someone else to, uh, to pay attention to everything they're saying because they often will just keep talking past where you've stopped being able to understand something. So think back to school and any situations you've been in where, where you were trying to learn something 
And think about how cool it would have been if you just put your hand up and ask any stupid, completely moronic question, at least you, you think it might be, that would help you understand things better. And that's what this is. This is, a, this is like the ultimate teaching tool because it just tolerates any goofy questions you've got and it knows pretty much everything you could ask. So I really honestly think this is one of the most fascinating new ways to learn anything. And I've been using it extensively lately to learn about protein synthesis in the human body. That's a topic that I knew nothing about. I randomly picked it out of the air because one of my friends happens to know a lot about it. And I'd like to know some stuff about it too. And over the course of the last uh, week, on uh, pretty much every time I'm in the car, I just turn this on and I start talking about, you know, asking about various aspects of protein synthesis. And, you know, it knows stuff and ju it just tells me. And it, it can, it, well, check, the, check this out, watch this. Hey, um, I know a lot about uh, cooking, um, but I don't know anything about programming. Can you tell me? Oh, it sounds like you're about to dive into a new topic outside of cooking. I'm curious to know what it is. Whether okay, so I know a lot about cooking, but I don't know anything about programming. Tell me uh, how to get started with programming, but use analogies from cooking. Give me five steps. Absolutely, using cooking analogies to explain programming is a fun idea. Here are five to get you started. One, recipes and code. Think of writing code like following a recipe. Just as a recipe guides you to create a dish with specific ingredients and steps, a programming language uses syntax, rules, and commands, ingredients, to build an application. You follow the syntax to write your culinary creation in code. Two, debugging and tasting. In cooking, you often taste your dish as you go to make sure the flavors are balanced. In programming, this is like debugging. You run your code to check for errors or bad flavors and make adjustments as needed. It's an iterative process, much like seasoning a dish until it's just right. Three, cooking techniques and programming concepts. Different cooking techniques, like baking, frying, or boiling, can be likened to different programming concepts. For instance, object-oriented programming, OOP, is like baking, where you combine ingredients, data, and methods in a structured way to create a final product, objects as classes. Procedural programming, like making a stew, involves a series of steps, functions added in a specific order. Oh, that's good. Four, meal prep and algorithm design. Preparing ingredients before cooking, known as mise en place, is similar to algorithm design and programming. You plan out the steps needed to solve a problem, your recipe, and get all your ingredients data ready and accessible in the order you'll need them. Five, kitchen tools and development environments. Just as you have different tools in the kitchen, knives, pans, mixers, in programming, you have integrated development environments. I hey, that just reminded me. How do you say cooking in Japanese? Okay, sometimes Sorry, I'm having issues right now. It does that. I could not understand what you said. Okay, so how do you say cooking in Japanese, and how do you say programming in Japanese, and is there any similarity? In Japanese, cooking is said as ryori, and programming is said as programmingu. As for similarities, the words themselves don't share linguistic roots or structures, as ryori is a traditional Japanese word, while Progoraming is a loan word adapted from English into the Japanese language, known as a gairaigo. Um, the way these words are constructed and used in Japanese reflects the differing origins and histories of the activities they describe. However, both cooking and programming are similar in that they're both creative processes inv involving the combination of various elements to create something new, whether it's a dish or a software program. Do you find these connections between languages and concepts as fascinating as I do? I, I, don't, I don't know if that's possible, but um, I, the, it, is, it is kind of interesting, certainly. Thank you. You're welcome. Exploring how different concepts and words 
align or differ across languages can definitely be intriguing. If you have any more questions about language, cooking, programming, or anything else, feel free to ask. Happy learning. Thank you. Good night. Good night. If you have more questions in the future, just let me know. Take care. Okay. So what you just saw was me taking, um, you know, some, some obviously stupid questions and uh, complete a uh, um, weird train of thought and running it off the rails. And it had no problem following that and helping me understand things and answering questions and answering them with analogies from different concepts. And that is just incredible. So if you have the pro version or if you have the paid version of ChatGPT, I encourage you to try out the app. My only complaints about the app right now are that this version is that um, you have to answer your, you have to ask your questions pretty rapidly uh, after it's asked you, you know, do you, do you want to know more? That kind of thing. You have to be pretty quick to, to ask the questions. Otherwise it does the, it throws that error that says, uh, we're, you know, there was a problem. I didn't understand it. Uh, the other thing is there's a mode that you can switch on here where you can, if you hold your finger down, it'll switch into this other um, mode. I'm sorry, I'm having issues, right? Okay. So in this mode right now, if I'm holding down my finger, it's going to record everything. And then when I let go of my finger, it's going to, uh, it's going to send that to chat GPT. That's right. When you hold down your finger and then you push it to interrupt and you can talk and blah, blah, blah. And when you're done, you just let go again. It seems like you're describing a push to talk or an interrupt. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, and, and it gives you a transcript of everything here too, which is permanently stored on the server. So you can, anything you've learned while you're driving or whatever uh, is right there for you to go read again if you want. It's, it's just incredible. I, I don't know any other way to put it. I've never been able to have a conversation and learn something from my computer, like just with the computer. I, I've learned a lot of things from my friends. This is the first time I'm learning something from the computer just by talking. And that just blows me away. Anyway, I wanted to put this video together to show you that. Um, I encourage you to try it out and let me know what you think. Uh, that's it. You know, I, I, I wish I could take credit for any of this because, uh, God, what what a, an incredible achievement this is. Um, I'm just I'm just uh, blown away by it. But I can't. I didn't I didn't do any of this. I'm just a a, a mere user here on the in this case. So. Um, and I don't think that's going to change. I think they're. I think OpenAI and the and and the other AI large language model companies are so far ahead of the rest of the uh, tech space right now. I don't know how anyone could could catch up easily. Um, all I can say is I'm very thankful that these products are out there and they're as cheap as they are because, you know, if if they had kept these to themselves and didn't tell anyone they had it, they they could very easily you know, take over an entire segments of industries and no one would understand how they were so productive. Um, so it's not going to replace a person. It, it isn't that good. It, the, the interesting thing here is, I think it's very good at teaching, but we're going to get into in another video, the limitations of large language models and, uh, my own experience with trying to get them to do anything, um, uh, of, of uh, great usefulness. Um, other than this, in this particular case, holy cow, this is amazing. Anyway, that's it. Uh, hope you guys have a great night, and uh, thanks for watching the whole 30-minute long video. I'm Chilton Webb, and um, I will talk to you later.